Welcome to Healthy Pets, Healthy Owners. I'm Dr. Edmund Sokowski. You know, we're here almost at the end of February. It's a cold, brisk morning today. And I can't wait for February to be over and March to disappear and, and nice warm weather to come back. But we have an interesting topic today and a wonderful guest. Our guest today is Mr. Tom Yakupin. Tom is in the health insurance business. He's in life insurance business as well. But we're here to talk today about what we can do to get health coverage, health insurance. So let's welcome Tom Yakupin from West Penn Life and Health. Tom, welcome back to the show. Thanks for it's having me. It's always my pleasure to have you on here because you give so much information that actually impacts us on a daily basis regarding our health insurance. And I'm, my first question to you, Tom, is would you define the difference between health insurance and health care? We hear it in the news all the time as health care, mm -hmm. whatever it is, mm -hmm. but there's a difference. Sh certainly, yeah, uh, and, and very obviously health care is uh, what is uh, rendered, you know, by a physician or practitioner of medicine, right? A physician, an anesthesiologist, a surgeon, a radiologist, a dentist. Uh, that's healthcare. These are people, your primary care physician. These are people that are caring for your health. That's what they went to school to do. They understand the body you know, the endocrine system, the uh, circulatory system, et cetera. That's health care. Health insurance uh, is an entirely different uh, monster, right? Health insurance is a product. It's a financial product. It started off many, many years ago. I'm sure some of your listening audience will remember perhaps their mother and dad saying, uh, we, we got a job at the coal mine and thank goodness we got hospitalization benefits with it. And that was very common, hospitalization benefits. So the term hospitalization back then meant if I got sick and ended up in a hospital or I needed some type of surgery, there was some type of financial protection for me if I ended up in the hospital. That's correct. Yeah, the early model, um, uh, the early model of health insurance was really you bought a policy from a company such as Blue Cross, Blue Shield, that indemnified the consumer, which simply means this is a contract of insurance, much like you have insurance on your home or insurance on your car, that if something happened after a deductible, um, that insurance company would step in and write a check to your physician or your hospital to take care of that catastrophic loss or that unexpected loss that that consumer did not foresee due to a heart attack or stroke or you know any Some any type of accident a accident whatever so there's health care and then there was health insurance and really it's no different today except the narrative has changed what do you mean by the narrative Tom? well uh, I noticed in about the 1990s, um, you know, there, there was a lot of talk of a health care crisis. The costs of health care are rising, and they are, and they've continued to rise. Uh, but the early, in the early 90s, the narrative was we have a health care crisis, health care crisis, health care crisis, and their solution um, was a universal uh, health insurance program to somehow fix this health care crisis, uh, which I found to be interesting. And that was, you know, in the Clinton days, and I think it was um, t with, with tongue in cheek often referred to as Hillary Care. I don't know how many people remember that. That's actually when we started to hear about this universal approach to health insurance, That's although right. they called health care. How long have you been in the insurance business? Well, I got my license in 1985. So, uh, so you were at the beginning of all this change. I was, yeah. Yeah, I was. And, you know, and I didn't, you know, when I got into the business, I was, you uh, know, wet behind the ears and full of bananas. You know what I mean? I was 23. You don't know. Uh, there's a lot of things I didn't know. And, um, and I started with Metropolitan Life more on the life and financial side. And in 1988, I lived in Baltimore, Maryland and was introduced uh, to a large uh, body of in health insurance producers doing some very unique things for the self-employed and changed my focus radically. And, and so I would say from 1988 to today, that has been 90% of my focus, yes. And you've seen these changes in 
policies, you've seen the changes in laws, you've seen the changes in even people's attitudes. Correct. What are, what are some of those changes that have, have occurred? Well, for example, I, I can recall in, in the late 80s, uh, 1990, I moved to Cincinnati and, and opened an office there in the Midwest, began to hire and train agents. and um, I can recall in the 1990s, we could ensure a family with a, you know, a basic hospitalization plan with a $1,000 deductible, $500 deductible for about $300 to $350 a month. We're talking a whole family. A whole family. And that was an insurance plan, and people probably remember this, where there were not terms like networks, PPO, HMO, EPO, uh, kind of the alphabet soup of insurance today. You know, you, you didn't have a relationship between the insurance company and the doctor or hospital back then. In fact, years ago, uh, when hospitalization was first introduced, insurance companies paid a schedule of benefits. In other words, you bought a bucket of money, a million dollar major medical, which was a lot of money back in the, the late 80s, and that policy would pay up to, but not to exceed, um, so much money per procedure. And, and they limited that loss to a term called usual, customary, and reasonable, UCR. But the consumer could go to any doctor, any hospital, anywhere. The insurance companies back then were not calling the shots. And this is the important point that I've seen, uh, the, the, the big change that I've seen over the years. And when I say the insurance company was not calling the shots, in the olden days, the insurance company simply provided a policy to the consumer which indemnified the consumer. But the consumer was free to pick any hospital, any doctor, anywhere in the United States for that matter. The bigger thing was that the doctor and the surgeon, there was they were not being manipulated or controlled by the insurance company. In other words, there was no relationship between insurance company and provider. And that's the biggest change that I've observed now. Wow. You have the insurance companies dictating to the physician treatment. Well, let's take it a step further. In some cases, you have the insurance company owning the entire health system, which means you have the insurance company writing the checks which now owns the hospital, which de facto owns the network of doctors. And so what they have is they have a system where they're bringing people in, telling people, you know, the narrative today is you need insurance to access affordable care, okay? Which I, I, I say that is not true. And we can prove that is not true. So you have the insurance company bringing people in, charging them, in some cases, significant premiums. I mean, I, we had a gentleman call our office with seven children, husband and wife, seven children. He's being asked to pay $2,000 a month for his health care plan. This health care company, one of the big giants here in the tri-state area, they have a, a kind of a monopoly, right? His, I read through his health care plan, and, it, and first of all, if he doesn't seek treatment at their hospital using their doctors, he has no coverage at all, no protection at all. So the insurance company is forcing the consumer to buy products and services at their store being their hospital, you see? The old company store. The you? old company store. You yeah. gotta buy here or this this contract you have doesn't work. So it's a very expensive contract. Then you look deeper into the mechanism and you find that the prices at their company store are very high, very high. In fact, um, I believe it is attributed to Mark Twain who said it's easier to fool a person than to, t than to explain to a person that they have been fooled. And, and I say that to say this, we can prove, especially now with the price honesty and price transparency movement, that in many cases, people with these insurance arrangements, Ed, are paying more for products and services with insurance than they would if they just paid cash and said, I don't have any insurance at all. What's this x-ray gonna cost, okay? And when you begin to pull back the layers 
um, of uh, obfuscation and the layers of deceit and, the, and you look into the price gouging. It's a horrible situation for many, especially for those in the working middle class who do not get government subsidies when they log into healthcare.gov to buy one of these health plans. Okay, Tom, let's, let's start off by designing, defining some terms. What's a copay? A copay. A copay is a, a, a term in a contract mm -hmm. where a consumer who has an insurance product, who sees a doctor, still has to pay mm -hmm. 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 dollars at the point of service for that product or service, that x-ray, that CAT scan, that office visit, a copay. That means Mr. Consumer, who's paying a, a monthly premium already, um, when he or she sees their uh, office, uh, their primary care physician, they have to pay a $50 copay. You know, they have some flesh in the game, so to speak. So th that gives them some responsibility. And, and what is the purpose for this copay? Uh, the purpose for the copay, from my standpoint, is the insurance company is controlling their losses, you know, and in some cases, Ed, uh, I believe the copay itself is probably more than enough to cover the, the entire cost of the procedure, and then in some cases, I think the insurance company pays very little to nothing behind closed doors at the end of the day. In other words, they, they might negotiate with the doctor and say, hey, listen, you know, for everybody that walks in your door with this expensive health plan, um, you collect a $50 copay from them and we're gonna reimburse $48.30. You know, so that doctor might be getting $98.30 total, 50 from the consumer and X number of dollars from the insurance company. And that's if you're within your, your, their network. your network. But if you go outside the network, then that, you, you that pay provider could, could bill you for the remainder of it. That's correct. And that happens quite frequently. Oh, it does, yeah. So what are out-of-pocket expenses? Well, out-of-pocket expenses are, when you look at these insurance contracts, um, I had a gentleman bring one into my office the other day. He said, my plan has no deductibles. And, you know, and that sounds good, of course. You know, I like to read through the contract. You know, my father, years ago, an, an old school engineer used to say, son, when looking at any agreement, remember the big print giveth and the small print taketh away. So, <laughs> that's, that's so true. And most of these contracts are small print. Yeah. So, you know, I began to dig into his plan. And while he had no deductible if he went into the uh, hospital, he had a $3,500 copay per day for a period of time. I think the first two days. So, in essence, if he was in the hospital for five days, the first 7,000 is on him. So, out of pocket can be a copay. Out of pocket can, can come from another term that insurance companies use called co-insurance, meaning after a deductible, a policy might pay 80-20 or 70-30, meaning the 20% of the bill is yours. So you have a $10,000 bill, uh, you have a deductible, which is your part of that $10,000 bill, then you might have 20% of the re remainder of the bill um, that is also your part. That is cost sharing or additional out of pocket. So I hear people talk about insurance all the time. I think it's the focus on everybody's lives anymore. And I think in part it's probably because it's in news all the time. It is. And you know, the population is getting somewhat older. People have that on their minds. So I hear this all the time. I've met my yearly deductible. Mm -hmm. well, explain that to us. Well, let's say for example, um, that an individual has a 7,000 $400 annual deductible with their uh, ACA qualified comprehensive health plan. Uh, that individual ha has, has to meet, has to have expenses that equal $7,400 before much of that insurance covers anything. Before he's covered 100% following, you know, f following that for testing, therapy, surgery, hospitalization, et cetera. Once that deductible's met for the rest of the year, the insurance company's on the hook to pay for everything. To pay for everything. So that's, again, your out-of-pocket expenses Correct. part of that, that equation. That is, yeah. And what, what I like to show people, when I look at these plans, 
is I like to look at their fixed cost. Like let's say, for example, Joe Blotz is paying $1,000 a month for his health plan. Well, if he doesn't use that health plan, Ed, if he never files one claim, his best case scenario in this risk management strategy is it's going to cost him $1,000 a month times 12, $12,000, right? Thousand. Yeah. So that's his best case scenario. His worst case scenario would be $12,000 and potentially his deductible, which it's not uncommon to see deductibles of $7,400 or more for a family today. So that means his worst case scenario would be the 12 grand plus the seven grand. And then you might have co-pays in addition to that. And then there could be additional costs from out of network expenses, meaning, you know, he was bad, bad boy. You didn't go to our company store to get your, uh, your treatment rendered. So they may not pay all or any of something outside of network. And, and by the way, you know, th this is part of the problem driving up health care, you see. And now I'm not talking insurance, I'm talking health care. The consumer today has been trained, let's say, groomed over a period of time to focus more on their insurance than on the care or the cost of care. Meaning what? Meaning the average consumer today, you, you know, they don't ask questions like, what does this x-ray cost? You know, what would this x-ray cost if I didn't have insurance? Uh, what's, this, what's the benchmark price of this CAT scan? We're not even taught to ask that question. All we know is what's my monthly premium? What's my copay? What's my deductible? You know, and I'm going to trust the insurance company to uh, save the day. Well, that's part of the problem to the ever increasing prices of health care. You see, nobody's watching the company store. And, and so we know that in some cases, in fact, in many cases, insurance companies are being billed, uh, you know, in some cases we've seen examples of a, uh, of a pacemaker that we know might cost $10,000 wholesale being billed a hundred thousand to the insurance company. Okay, then why does the consumer care? You know, the insurance company is paying the tabs. Well, the reason that we should care is this is driving the costs of things, right? And it's also forcing the premiums through the roof today, where a hospitalization plan instead of three hundred or three fifty a month for a family is now. 12 or 15 or 2,000 a month. In other words, the insurance companies are getting rich and the providers uh, inside of the machine, inside of the company store, you, you know, the uh, implements and the, the devices. And, you know, I saw an example of a hospital bill where uh, some fentanyl for a nasal surgery, which cost the hospital $1.75 wholesale, $1.75 wholesale was on the hospital bill, I think it was $300 per treatment. Okay, imagine that. Yeah. Why are they getting away with that? Because nobody's asking the question. Yeah, and I'm not going to mention any names, but it's actually a local company and, and they made this, this uh, life-saving uh, pen with epinephrine in it. Right. Well, there was a dollar worth of epinephrine in there. Mm -hmm. A dollar. A dollar's worth of epinephrine. And they're, I mean, I, I'm allergic to bee stings, so I carry one of these so-called uh, life-saving things with me every day. And I used to pay, I used to get two for $50, and all of a sudden they were $700. And they only last for three months on average. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money every year to keep this this pen with you, but you need it because if you, if for me, if I get stung by a bee or somebody's allergic to, to peanuts, for example, you need that epinephrine. You do. So why does that happen that, that an insurance company, I mean a manufacturer, can, can produce something that costs them roughly, uh, well, let's say, let's even give them the benefit, it costs them $20 to produce it. How can they charge $700 for something like that and get away with it? Right. Um, you know, the, the, the simple and the most obvious answer is because they can, all right? But the bigger picture is, is this, uh, and you and I were talking about this before we went live on the show, that, you know, there is a health care crisis in America. 
And, you know, we just had this week the, the Democratic debate, you know, with, with the remaining political leaders on, on the Democratic side, uh, Bernie Sanders being a front runner, Elizabeth Warren another. Uh, of course, Mike Bloomberg has stepped into the game. Um, and interestingly enough, last night at the gym, I was listening to a podcast with Joe Rogan and Bernie Sanders because I'm a believer we have a problem in the United States with health care. But I don't think the American people are hearing solutions and really getting answers on, you know, the mainstream media, uh, you know, the, the 15 second sound bites that we're getting on whether, you know, the GOP or, or the DNC uh, debates. So I'm trying to dig deeper in, into the narrative. And the truth is, you know, what you have is you have what I call crony capitalism. All right. Meaning people on the far left believe we have a problem. Uh, the, the American people are being gouged by big pharma. Are they correct? They are correct. It is true. Uh, they, they point out how that the administrative costs in health care in America are many times more than in Canada or many other um, well-to-do nations. Are they correct? They are correct. Yeah. You know, these things are, these are verifiable truths. But, but the challenge here, the big, the big picture here is, what is the answer? Is the answer more government? Um, I, I, that is where I, I do not believe that is where we go as, as the American people. But I don't disagree that there's some big problems. Now, here's what's happening. What happens is, is in many cases, companies uh, such as certain pharmaceutical manufacturers who, by the way, through uh, taxpayer dollars, you know, um, often receive funding for, uh, it, it, you know, ch uh, experimental s uh, studies, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we have a lot of good things coming out of the pharmaceutical industry in this country, but the American people are not benefiting from many of the federal dollars being bankrolled to big pharma. So a company like the one you're speaking of find success they have a niche market and very often what they do ed is because they begin to make so much money they then hire lobbyists okay lobbyists which i don't even know how we permit this because frankly in some ways a lobbyist is they, they are professional uh bribery artists yes. and big corporations send lobbyists to washington dc to lobby government and then what these big corporations will do is apply pressure through the existing government enterprise to write legislation to close the door behind the successful corporation on any competition coming behind them. And, and what you will find is when you see these egregious prices, when you see uh, tremendous price gouging, like it, it makes no sense why um, they might charge $700 for something that we know wholesale uh, cost 20. Or it makes no sense why certain pharmaceutical pills in the United States uh, uh, cost 700 or 800% of what they do in India or Canada. Well, it, it makes sense when you begin to see that certain government agencies make it so hard for any competition and the lack of competition creates a monopoly to where then the people of the United States basically get hosed. And then those politicians end up having some money in their re-election fund or something Hello. like, that, something like yeah. that. So it's a job security for them, I guess. And, and, that, and that's a big concern. And it is a big problem. A big problem. But I think, Tom, the, the fundamental problem is this confusion between health care and health insurance, number one. Number one. That understanding and that we've developed this, this reactive instead of proactive response to, to our health condition. Yes, sir. And we need to change that around because what we're doing now, we say, okay, you know, eat what you want, drink what you want, smoke what you want, sit on a couch all day long, whatever, whatever you wanna do, and then when you get sick, let's deal with it. Right. And that, we need to reverse that mindset. We do, yeah, we do. Um, I, I think many thinking people in this arena uh, realize the importance of personal responsibility. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, uh, life is lived by choice much more than it is chance. There are people that are plagued with certain genetics. You can't outrun genealogy. There are people that are just um, 
in some cases, the victims of unfortunate accidents, or, you know, and, and we understand it. Those are risks that, that we face in life. But at the end of the day, personal responsibility, such as, you know, taking control of one's diet, um, exercise, uh, you know, drinking that glass of water instead of that uh, Coca-Cola, you know, uh, and, you know, sage wisdom is an apple a day keeps the doctor away, not a Snickers bar, although I do like the Snickers <laughs> bar, you know, you know, so, so there's, there are some things we can do to control risks. The other thing that I think is important to bring out is there's a term called Stockholm syndrome, and I'm not an expert in the term, um, but, but my understanding is Stockholm syndrome can be described as oftentimes like a captor or a victim of a hostage situation or kidnapping uh, over a period of time psychologically to deal with a horrific situation actually becomes, um, you, you know, per perhaps they develop an odd but caring relationship for their abuser, okay? I think in a sense, the American people, that we've developed a, a sort of Stockholm syndrome with uh, our current insurance arrangement, you know? Um, in fact, it, it's difficult to, you know, like when you go, if you fly out of the Pittsburgh airport, you know, you're constantly seeing ads of our, you know, big loving uh, insurance companies in town, our healthcare systems, you know, and that's another term that makes me sick, healthcare system. And, and, and we're being trained to trust and love these people. This is our answer. I disagree. The answer is personal responsibility as much as possible. Another answer, and you and I will be talking with this gentleman soon, um, is a movement that is sweeping the United States, mm -hmm. it, which is the free market medical movement, spearheaded by the FMMA, Free Market Medical Association. And that, I think that's an important factor that we need to educate everybody on. And, and that's really taking charge, I think, of your own personal health. It is. So we're going to take a little break here in a minute, Tom. Okay. When we come back, we're going we're gonna to explain how you can actually do something in about, about it to be in control of your health care through health insurance. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really understanding how to do that with the proper health insurance. That's correct. And we're going to be back here in a minute at Healthy Pets, Healthy Owners with Mr. Tom Yakupin from West Penn Life and Health. We'll see you in a minute. Welcome back to Healthy Pets, Healthy Owners. I'm Dr. Edmund Sokowski, and we're here with Mr. Tom Yakupin from West Penn Life and Health. And we're talking so about something that is so important and it impacts every one of us on a daily basis, and that's health insurance. And we're making that differentiation between health care and health insurance. Hey, Tom, this is something that's in the news constantly, and it's a term that makes me cringe. But what is this Medicare for all stuff? Medicare for all. Well, again, as I said earlier in the show, uh, I was watching a, a podcast yet last evening with Joe Rogan and Bernie Sanders, who, who Bernie Sanders in this podcast talked about his plan for Medicare for all, right? Because again, um, we're all looking at these problems with the delivery of health care in America, the cost of health care in America, but many of us are coming to different conclusions as a result of studying this. Mr. Sanders, um, his philosophy is this, Medicare, which Medicare is a uh, national insurance program started by Lyndon Johnson following the uh, murder or assassination of President John Kennedy, I think it was at or around 1965, and uh, the United States government uh, launched Medicare to protect our citizens age 65 and above. Uh, and anybody that uh, is 65 or above understands what I'm talking about. They get a card in the mail. They can sign, uh, they get Medicare Part A, which covers hospitalization. They can sign up for Medicare Part B uh, at, a, at a small additional premium of at or about $145 a month, which covers outpatient medical expenses, office visits, testing, therapy. 
and individuals in the United States of America, Medicare eligible individuals age 65 and older, and in some cases under if they're on total uh, disability, etc., have access to health care in the United States, any doctor, any hospital, anywhere from coast to coast that accepts Medicare. It's a, it's, it's a true um, national insurance program, okay? Undeniable. It is a federal health care program. Medicare for all, as Mr. Sanders wants to roll it out, uh, it would be basically maintaining that system but beginning to expand the coverage. In other words, instead of uh, 65 and ab above, he might roll it back to 60 and then 55 and then 50. And over a period of time, what they would do is simply expand Medicare as it is to cover everybody in the United States, which would eventually um, be a universal health care system paid for through payroll taxes and other mechanisms that he is or others are proposing. So, you know, th th that's what it is. Um, and and for, for many people, many thinking people, and this is, this is not something that you can listen to a debate on CNN or Fox News and come to a conclusion on. This is, these are big issues. And, and I think that it all has to be looked at um, but, but Medicare for all, that's what it is. And your question is, what is it? That's what it is. So the, the current Medicare for 65 and older is mandated by law. Yes, it is. It's law. So once you turn 65, you automatically have to be on that. You get it. Yeah. You've paid for it through your payroll taxes. You get it. Okay. So this now is total coverage. So I'm going to think back for a second here and back in, what was it? Oh, Seven, oh, eight, oh, nine, somewhere in there when the so-called, uh, what do they call it, the uh, Affordable Care Act, right. uh, which is an oxymoron in my, in my opinion, yes. because I, I don't think the Affordable Air Ca uh, what, uh, Care Act, Care Act yep. was ever affordable, right. but um, we termed it Obamacare, which is you know, another term I don't like to use. Mm -hmm. In any case, that's actually how I met you because I had a typical, you know, insurance plan that kept rising up and up. And then what happened with Obamacare kicking in, my my insurance plan went was wiped out mm -hmm. just in the middle of its of its coverage. You know, its yearly yearly coverage just what just totally was saying, hey, you don't have it anymore, whether you want it or not. And then the new plan that they that they put in its place. Mm -hmm was the size of a mortgage payment on a house. Right. And I'm not someone that runs because I, to a physician because I sneeze, you right. know. I wanted something to cover me in a case I broke an, an arm, I, I had a heart attack, I developed cancer, or something to that effect, what we call what, catastrophic care? Correct, catastrophic. So I, I came to you and I talked to you about that and you were kind enough to sit down, I think for two hours with me and go over everything. Yes. And I ended up getting a plan through you. That's right. Which went from, a seventeen hundred dollar a month insurance policy plan that they wanted to shove down my throat to something under four hundred bucks. That's right. And yet I have good coverage. You do. So t so tell us about that. Is well, you know, the, you know, the funny thing was, and, and I thought this was the biggest insult to me mm -hmm. when they passed the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, the people that passed the law made themselves exempt. legally exempt from it. They did. And so they have. They have the plan that I had before, <laughs> that taxpayer dollars are paying for, and excluded themselves, but made me do it. Right, right. So is that going to be the same thing with this, with this Medicare thing? Well, um, if, look, we, we don't know what Medicare all, for all would ultimately look like because it's still just a concept. And, and this is the thing that I caution the American voter of. You know, I, I, I'm going to be 59 this year in April, all right? And I must tell you, I've been lied to by politicians on both sides of the aisle for, the, for as long years. as I've been paying attention, okay? Yeah. And, you know, and I can remember some specific statements that were sold to the American people on this Affordable Care Act, like if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. If you like your health plan, you can keep your health plan. Everybody's gonna save $2,500 a year. And, and those things were not true, which is why you have so much polarization in America about what to believe 
and who to believe, okay? Yeah. Um, there exists the possibility, and, 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 and I have to say it, there exists the possibility that Medicare for all could work out well for the American people. It's working in Canada uh, to some degree. It's working in uh, European countries to some degree, okay? But, um, but, but here's the challenge. We don't know because we don't know what the law would entail. We don't know what the reimbursement rates would look like. You know, they may cut costs to providers and doctors so low that we have difficulty finding providers. Well, there are providers that don't take Medicare now. Th there are. And there are a whole lot of things that people are not aware of that must be calculated into any of these decisions. I go back to this. I don't think that the conclusion of Medicare for all is necessarily what is needed in the United States, especially based upon the premise of our nation being one of liberty and freedom. You know, you have a lot of people in, this is a big country, and I've been very fortunate not only to travel throughout our, our nation, but around the world. Um, but I'm telling you, if you travel to New York City, as I do once a year, and then to Hazard, Kentucky, uh, or to deep Alabama, then to Santa Barbara, you're going to find that you almost have in the United States many little nations. There's a lot of different cultures, a lot of different ways of thinking uh, in our great country. You know, here in Pennsylvania, an example is the Pennsylvania Dutch or the Amish. They don't even participate in Medicare, and they don't want any part of it. You know, what do you do with them? Do you force these people who have um, a religious conviction into something that they're opposed to? In a socialistic ideology, you would. You would, and this is the thing. And yet, see, our country is based on individual freedoms and liberties. And, and that's the challenge with central planners. Central planning begins to step on the the premise of individual liberties and freedoms and in some cases it would step on religious freedom so so i'm very concerned about that but i go back to this that's what medicare for all is i don't think it needs to be that complicated to fix some of the problems in our great nation one of the things that, that is happening today ed is a, is direct primary care which is part of the free market medical movement and, and there was an executive mandate signed into law by the current administration that is, that is basically requiring hospitals and providers to begin revealing their pricing to people so that consumers can make informed decisions when getting health care. And now we're, we're calling that transparency. Price transparency, yes. And, and I believe that it is a much needed step toward reforming the price of health care because what it's going to do is it's going to reveal to the consumer the gouging and the manipulation that is currently going on and it will force the bad players through shaming the bad players into bringing their prices more in line with benchmark prices. Well you know that's always been going along in dentistry that's always been occurring when you walk in and, and you have a diagnosis and you say well okay you need three fillings you need a crown you need a root canal you get an estimate, you walk out there with this is what this is going to be. Yes. Yet when you walk into a hospital or you walk into a physician's office, where you have, you're clueless. That's right. And you get a surprise at the end. A surprise at the end. It would be the equivalent of going to uh, a very nice restaurant with a group of people and you open the menu and, and you notice that nothing in the menu has a price attached to it. And somebody asks the uh, waiter, hey, this, is, this all looks wonderful, but what's it going to cost? And the waiter says, oh, don't worry about it. Order what you want. We'll send you a bill in a couple of weeks. We'll work it out. Okay? You wouldn't do that. And we don't do that when we buy a car or a can of tuna fish or a suit of clothes or anything else. We want to know what it costs so that we can price compare and shop. A marketplace of a necessity requires transparency. And when that transparency does not exist, as consumers, we must say, why? 
Why are you hiding this? And that is where the shenanigans are occurring in healthcare pricing and delivery today. So one of the big steps to the Free Market Medical Association, which by the way, let me put a plug out for them, folks should visit them at www.fmma.org, Free Market Medical Association, a wonderful team of people doing amazing things for true grassroots reform. Um, Dr. Marty McCary, who I met at last year's FMMA meeting in Dallas, along with Ron Paul and many others, Dr. Marty McCary uh, is a, a, a major player in reform. He's written a book, Unaccountable. He followed it up with another book, The Price We Pay, which is a New York Times bestselling uh, uh, book or author. He's worked in Johns Hopkins. Uh, as you know working with cancer protocols and he is a whistleblower he's inside the system saying there's some bad things going on and, and we are part of the problem just like I'm a whistleblower as somebody inside of the insurance business going we're also part of the problem okay and, and, and the American people need to know that all right but I think this, I think price transparency, I think another thing that is very positive is the American people waking up and realizing you have a right to know, number one. Number two, you have a choice. The other thing that I see occurring is a resurgence of direct primary care physicians such as my doctor, Rebecca Plute in Cannonsburg, PA, Paragon Personal Health Care, or a guest we've had on the show before, Dr. Kirsten Lynn of Family Matters Direct uh, Primary Care. Uh, I just saw in the news, uh, there's uh, Dr. Wong in Pittsburgh is now, a, is now treating anybody in Pittsburgh in his practice for primary care needs for $35. And these people don't take any insurance, they don't want insurance, they're returning uh, back to uh, the, the business of medicine on a cash pay basis with price transparency. And what you're finding is the prices that they're negotiating or charging for office visits, labs, testing, blood work. It's extremely affordable. Well, part of the reason for that is to submit your claim to the insurance company costs money. It costs money. And, and what, they're, what they're in the habit of doing is rejecting that claim to delay payment, yes. causing you to resubmit it, which costs additional money, That's right. before they end up getting their money, which is reduced. And, and many of these direct primary care models, you'll find that they're cutting out heavy layers of costly administration because they're forced to run efficiently. For example, Dr. Wong, as I understand it, he does almost everything in his office from intake, signing patients in, you know, billing and, and all of that. And it's all very simple because he's not dealing with government bu bureaucracy, nor is he dealing with the inefficiency of insurance bureaucracy, okay? It's direct. And I think most consumers can relate to this, that the best way to buy a product or service is to cut out the middleman. Go direct to the person vending the product or service. You're going to get the best deal, okay? That makes common sense, and it applies to medicine, okay? Well, you taught me that. I was actually, as a provider, was unaware of this stuff mm -hmm. myself, but I needed a series of blood work, and I went to a local hospital, and I asked them, well, I'm not going to submit this to my insurance. Mm -hmm. what, are, what are my costs if I pay cash? Well, I got this look on their faces like, oh, my. Give us a little time and we'll calculate that. So they did. They <laughs> sat down and what was, I don't know, there was a bunch of blood work totaled to be 800 bucks. And the same blood work a couple years ago was a few thousand dollars <laughs> a few submitted dollars. through the ins insurance company. They That's didn't right. pay a lot of it. And I had actually more out of my pocket to pay for that blood work than it would have if I had walked in and paid for cash. Now, that's something I didn't know until I sat down with that's Tom right. Yacopin. That's right. And, and that's part of what we do at West Penn Life and Health. It, it, we're not just into peddling products. I'm attempting to educate consumers and use our marketplace for a positive impact through education, um, problem solving, asking questions, you, you know, it, 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 we're attempting to look at every way possible that consumers can access health care, get what they need out of the health care system for the lowest possible cost, and manage risk, 
okay, in an affordable fashion. That's what insurance is. Insurance is a risk management strategy. You had mentioned insurance for like our house and our car. We don't turn in insurance when we go to change the oil or get our car washed. You do not. We have an accident, then we have that, that measure of protection to help us defray the cost if we have an accident. That's correct. That's kind of what you're saying. We need to do that with health, with health insurance. It certainly is a model that can work and is working. You know, and going back to what we discussed earlier, um, it's unfortunate because one of the provisions of the Affordable Care Act, Ed, is the government restricts insurance companies from crafting purely catastrophic health plans for individuals our age, okay? You have to ask yourself, why would you, why would you limit the type of insurance that a health insurance carrier can write when in fact it might be exactly what Tom Yakupin or Ed Sikulski wants? Meaning what? What would be a purely catastrophic health plan? Prior to the Affordable Care Act, Ed, uh, many of my self-employed customers could buy a $5 million, 100% catastrophic plan, that meaning that after a deductible, which might be high, it might be a $5,000 deductible, but after that $5,000 deductible, that client had everything paid 100% that was a covered expense, hospital, surgery, professional fees, testing, therapy. So the client had risk from zero to $5,000. Therefore, they took $5,000, put it in the cookie jar, and they paid cash for the small stuff. So they would negotiate great rates with, with, with their doctor. They would develop a good patient-provider relationship. They would pay cash for the office visit, cash for the x-ray, the lab, etc., and negotiate great prices while being protected against the bad stuff. That can work, but, but the government has restricted that which is again a problem. Why? Why does that yeah, well, occur? I was ask you that, Tom. Why? What What do you think? Well, I, I'm not a hundred percent certain. But what I what I go back to what they did was the law said in order to be compliant with the Affordable Health Care Act, you have to buy one of these kinds of plans, a qualified plan that has all of these mandated benefits, okay, maternity, pediatric wellness, counseling, prescription, unlimited this, that, and the other thing. So, so basically, the Affordable Care Act said in order to be exempt from the penalty, which originally the Affordable Care Act came with a penalty, right? Um, now it's no, it, there's no longer a penalty, but they said, look, if you don't buy this, we're going to spank you, okay, with, with a financial penalty. Um, and they took away all of the other choices and options. That, that is very questionable. It's very suspect. And, and, and I believe that people that say, well, a free, a free market has failed the American people, I say not so. That is not true because we do not have a free market in America. Mm -hmm. We have a very controlled market, okay, while they wave the flag and tell you it's a free, but it is not free. Freedom is not buy this or get spanked, okay? That is not freedom. Just pick up the definition, read a Webster's Dictionary, okay? I just saw Obamacare as another tax. Another tax. That's all I saw it as. Yeah. And, and I have to interject. I'm anti-social and uh, anything or anybody that represents it, including, you know, that, that crew on the Democratic side. I understand. That, that, that tout the socialism. Yes. And you mentioned, and I have to throw this in here just to make myself feel okay about it. You mentioned Canada and its medicine, and you mentioned Europe. Well, in Canada, and, and when I went to school, I had, I don't know, there were about 17 classmates that were from Canada that were in graduate school with me. And they were talking years ago about all of this stuff. You know, that was in the late 70s, early 80s. And they would laugh at anybody talking about it because they would say, do you know the people from Canada come to the United States when they need surgeries? They don't have them done in, in, in Canada, number one. Number two is, you can go with a problem, it may take you six months to a year before you're ever seen. I agree. You know, and we don't have that problem here. I agree, I we, agree. We can get in right away. People don't know that about the, the Canadian system. And, and as I said earlier, you know, I've been very fortunate to travel the world, right? 
I've been to China, I've been to Hong Kong, I've been to Hope Spain. not recently. <laughs> no, uh, I, uh, but let me give you two very real examples, all right? Um, I was in British Columbia not long ago, and I took my youngest daughter, and we were at the Four Seasons there where not long ago the Olympics were, and there were uh, a lot of skiers and snowboarders, and uh, we had a young man Uber us over to the, uh, to, to the uh, arena, the rink over there, and I, I'm all, you know, of course, Caitlin just thought he was hot. I just wanted to, you know, and I'm asking questions about the healthcare system in Canada. And he said, it's funny you ask because I injured my knee skate, uh, skiing not long ago and I needed a CT scan or, or a scan done on the knee to determine the depth of damage. And it was going to be a six month wait, Ed, okay? Now, if you've ever injured your knee or a, a body part, waiting oh, six yeah. months, okay? So what, what happens is with these systems is oftentimes they're flooded and they're overloaded. They're a free system available to everybody, but they're, they're they don't have the providers. They don't have the window of opportunity. So you, you often have a two-tiered system. And this young man went to a walk-in clinic and simply paid cash to get what he needed. Now, another example of that is I was in Ireland two years ago for my birthday. Uh, and, and we were Ubering up the coast, um, and I asked the, the gentleman, you know, it was about a two-hour drive to get where we were going, and I asked him how he, how does the Irish healthcare system work, and it's similar to Europe, to the UK, but he says, we have a two-tier system. It may be a year or more if you are diagnosed with cancer or something to see a specialist for help, you know, it, it, okay, if you want to use the government system. He says, but what people do, and he was one of them, he bought an insurance product that allowed him to bypass the wait period and see a non-government doctor who would treat him now. So to me, that doesn't say much to the socialistic approach to it. To, it's to, a, it's to a healthcare. truth. To, that's correct. Ed. You know. And people need to know that factoring in their vote coming up uh, in the very near future. And I had some patients from England in my practice when I was in practice and they had the, they had free dental care the worst oral conditions I've seen mm -hmm. so so I don't think it, it it addresses the health care issue it may address the cost of the insurance issue but doesn't address the health care issue a concern that I have is, is Medicare currently treats age 65 and older it covers six those are the individuals who as we age are going to have the most health issues my concern is Medicare for all will flood the system and thus dilute the care and the cost to those who need it most. Okay? Yeah, I agree with you. There, 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 there can be unintended consequences, and there are unintended consequences to central planning all the time. I mean, if it takes a year to be treated for cancer, you could be dead in that year. You could be dead in that year. You, know, it, you, you, can, you can have a knee problem and not have it treated and actually have an infection that becomes systemic and kill you. So there, there are issues. There are. Tom, what do I need to do if I wanted to get into this plan that you offer at West Penn Life and Health? Sure. Um, we endorse a plan. Uh, we call it new, it's New Era Health Plans Incorporated. Um, and, and what New Era Health Plans is, is we're selling a hospital surgical plan on an indemnity chassis. Uh, that looks very much like old-fashioned hospitalization used to. A consumer has to qualify. In other words, it's not guaranteed issue. So, you, you know, you have to meet certain guidelines to get the plan. The premiums are typically 25% to 50% less than traditional major medical. You can use any doctor, any hospital, anywhere in America, and it's completely transparent. In other words, you'll know everything that it's gonna pay, you'll know what it's not gonna pay, and we'll teach you how to use it. The way that they would get in touch with us is they can visit the site online at newerahealthplans.com. There's a brief video they can watch, and they can fill out a form and, and contact us from there. And you're happy to sit down with anybody and go over this. Absolutely. And in full transparency, I'm a client of, of Tom's, and he, he had done that for me. Yeah. And then I had the opportunity to end up in the hospital you for surgery. You field tested it, didn't and you? And I field tested it, <laughs> and it, and it worked for me. Yes, it did. Paid my, my deductible, yeah. and the rest of everything else worked itself out. It did. So uh, I had coverage and medical care at the same time. Yes, sir. 
and I wasn't living in my car because I couldn't pay my health care insurance. Yeah, and you know, I think the bills you. were a little over 20000 or more, weren't they? In your yeah, opinion? they were way over 20000 yeah. 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 So anyway, Tom, we're at the end of the show. That was a wonderful show. I appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to come on and explain to us the difference between this health care, health insurance, and what we need to do to provide uh, protection. That's right, Ed. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Tom. Remember, a healthy pet is a happy pet. When you're healthy, you're happy as well. We'll talk to you next time on Healthy Pets, Healthy Owners. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.